In this episode of Mind Pump, we tackle a topic uh, that a lot of people approach us on a regular basis. People want to know what are the best supplements? What should I take? What is worth investing in? And what is a total waste of money? So what we did is we made it easy for you. We actually listed the top five most important supplements to take. We broke them all down for you. Uh, We broke them down into vitamins and minerals, common deficiencies. Filling vitamin and mineral deficiencies, easily the most important thing you could possibly do with supplements with profound effects on your health, performance, fat loss, and muscle building. We talk about protein and protein supplements, creatine and its effects. Talk about caffeine. And then we mentioned adaptogens. Now, adaptogens is a category of compounds that help the body deal with stress. Uh, Cordyceps, for example, is an adaptogenic uh, mushroom that helps the body deal with stress. What does that mean? It means uh, you burn more body fat, build more muscle, you improve your performance because your body adapts better to the stress of exercise and, of course, to the stresses of everyday life. Now, one of our favorite companies that covers lots of adaptogenic compounds, in fact, they have adaptogenic mixes with multiple adaptogenic compounds, is for Sigmatic. Now, Four Sigmatic specializes in mushroom-based supplements, in particular adaptogens, like I just mentioned, and they are having a massive, massive winter sale. Literally everything on their store is between 20 to 50% off. Here's the best part. If you use the code MINDPUMP or you click on the link in the show notes, so if you're listening to us on your phone, scroll down, click on the Four Sigmatic link, you'll get an additional 15% off on top of that. Now, the website is foursigmatic.com forward slash mind pump, code mind pump, or click on that special link. Also, this month, all month long, MAPS Split is 50% off. Now, MAPS Split is our workout program designed by bodybuilders, physique competitors, and bikini competitors. If your goal is to shape and sculpt your body, if there's specific areas of your body that you want to focus on in the gym. If you love working out, this is a a six-day-a-week routine. It is advanced, but it's extremely effective. MAP Split is for you. It's half off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsplit.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-P-L-I-T.com and use the code SPLIT50. That's S-P-L-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. I'm really excited to get into this topic. I think, uh, God, it was probably a couple of years ago um, when I shared with you guys a guide that I wanted to make, and we never got around to doing it. Mm. Uh, of course, it just didn't hit the top. This will be better, though. Yeah, the title of this episode, Things We Wanted yeah. to Do But Didn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, <that's, that's laughs> We're going to make up for it here. That, that is not. Uh, the title is going to be The Five Most Important Supplements to Take. But, oh, yeah. But really, the theme of the guide, what I, what I wanted to do, because- this is what I found the most value in later on, right? I think uh, we've shared openly on the podcast many times that we probably took every supplement under the sun as young teenage guys in early 20s trying to yeah. uh, you know, reach our goals faster. And later on, uh, the more that I learned about uh, nutrient deficiencies and performance supplements and what really moved the needle for not only me, but all the hundreds of clients that I train, I realized that I was wasting a lot of my money and I probably, if I was going to spend it on supplements, I probably should have geared it in another direction. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, this subject. And I think the first thing that we always uh, address when we talk about supplementation and no matter who we're sponsored by, uh, we will always recommend whole foods first. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where supplements come from. So what are supplements, right? Supplements uh, are products that you take that are designed to supplement your 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 current diet. Um, and they typically come in the form of pills, uh, you know, tablets, capsules, powders. Um, sometimes they come in liquid form. You can make them into teas. There's a lot of different ways to take supplements, but the idea is to Rectally. supplement. You're, you can yeah. actually supplement Should that way. Throw that in there. Yeah. yeah, not the way you do it though, Justin. It's I, like it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I'm advanced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but but su- that's what supplements are. Now we've been humans have been taking 
supplements uh, for a very, very long time. They, they exist in Chinese medicine, <clears throat> which is thousands of years old. And even in, in Western medicine, in the early days of Western medicine, people take, have taken lots of different supplements. In fact, some of the very first fat loss supplements, you can see, you can actually look these up on, on uh, Google. You can actually Google these pictures of some of the first advertisements for fat loss supplements. And um, some of the most popular ones in the early days were uh, tapeworm eggs. You could actually buy tapeworm eggs in capsule form. What was the idea of that Man. again? Tape weight worm, loss. Tape, weight loss. Yeah. Oh, wow. It, it so eats all your food. Take this parasite. Yeah, put a little friend in your body, help you eat your... <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, people would take them and actually lose weight. What bad could happen? You know, so supplements have been around um, for a very long period of time. Um, and you're, you're right, Adam. Food is always best. All supplements uh, in, initially got discovered in food. Um, and in food uh, products. There it is right there. Look at that. Fat banished tapeworms. Oh, that's yeah. so great. Isn't that funny? So they all they all came from things that we discovered that were in food. Um, and once we discovered what they did, we saw, oh, you could you should supplement with this because it could give you those benefits. Mm -hmm. That's not really how um, a lot of supplements work. Um, uh, so I, I want to kind of get into that. Before that, we talk about what supplements and what they do and the ones that we think are best. There are certain populations, certain segments of the population who tend to need supplements more than other people. And the reason for this is because there are certain segments of the population that either A, the risk of a deficiency uh, or the risk of having a deficiency is, is high, or B, um, you don't want to take a chance of having a deficiency if you're in a particular population. So for example, for that one, people who are women who are trying to conceive or who are pregnant. This is a great example of that, right? Are pregnant women or women who are trying to conceive, are there a greater percentage of them uh, with deficiencies versus the average person? Probably not, but their stakes are a little bit higher. For example, um, if your folate intake is a little low and you're not having a baby, uh, not that big of a deal. If you are having a baby, uh, not having enough folate can result in um, some serious issues. In fact, uh, I, I can't remember off the top of the head what the number one, maybe Doug can look that up, uh, one of the number one um, issues are related to a, a folate deficiency in, in pregnant women. Um, but I know that it has declined significantly mm. since uh, pregnant women and women who are trying to conceive have been given well, now they have advice like, to take folate. Right. right. They, I think that come. I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, that was one of the supplements in like Katrina's, you know, pregnant, they, they make pregnant multivitamins. Oh, right? prenatal. Yeah. Pre excuse me. Yes. Prenatal, right? So I know that that had, I know it had folate in it for sure. Yes. Neural tube uh, defects. Um, and they've gone down significantly um, since uh, pregnant women and women who are trying to conceive have been given, um, uh, have been told to take folate or prenatal vitamins have been, because that's a staple now in Western medicine. If you're trying to conceive or you're pregnant, your doctor's like, here's, uh, in fact, it's uh, prenatal vitamins oftentimes are prescription, which you don't need to have a prescription to get them, but oftentimes they will prescribe. Uh, these vitamins because of that. So that's a, that's one category, right? Well, another example would be people on specialty diets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we, and that's the, one of the reasons why I don't care for diets that much is because mm -hmm. when we tend to follow, and the more strict uh, a diet is, the more limiting it is uh, nutrient wise. If mm -hmm. you follow a carnivore, ketogenic, a vegan type of diet and you eliminate food groups completely out of your diet, Maybe for fat loss, uh, it is great for you. But what ends up happening a lot of times with those people is because they don't do the homework and research of, okay, now that I've completely eliminated this category of foods, what what what, what nutrients what, were I was I getting previously from that? And these things don't tend to like show themselves right away. No. You, you tend to see this after months or even years sometimes of consistently eating a certain way or eliminating certain foods in the diet. And sometimes the symptoms are general. They're not like extreme, like, oh my God, I'm dying. Uh, it can get to that point. And oftentimes people go to the doctor and then they'll test and be like, whoa, your vitamin B you know, 12 is super low or whatever. But sometimes people are just like, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. My skin is rashy or dry. Um, I have cracks at the corners of my mouth. My hair is brittle. Hair is brittle. Nails are weak. Constant bloat. 
Yeah, like like these kind of subtle symptoms that can come from uh, these nutrient deficiencies. I'm glad you said what you said, Adam, because the it's 100 percent true. And the number one category of you know spe- specialty diets that tends to result in deficiencies, not always, but it's a higher percentage are vegans. Uh, this is, by the way, this is not an anti-vegan thing to say. This is a statistic. This is an objective fact. This is true. You can look it up yourself. But vegans are at higher risk of nutrient deficiencies, in particular iron and B12. And if you are a vegan and you go to a doctor, um, the odds are that they rec- will recommend that you take uh, supplements to supplement your your diet because meat does provide certain uh, essential nutrients that are very difficult um, and some sometimes even impossible to get from uh, from from plant sources. Another one are are people who have food intolerances. Um, the reason why this can cause nutrient deficiencies, well, I'll give you a great example. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of these people, right? I have a, a bad food intolerance to dairy. I don't have a food allergy, but I do have a, a, an intolerance to dairy. Dairy just so happens to be one of the best sources or the greatest sources of calcium. So someone like myself would run a higher risk of having a calcium deficiency because I'm not eating any dairy. Mm -hmm. You may be one of these people. You may have an intolerance to a food category. Let's say you're allergic to fish. The odds that you may have uh, a deficiency in omega-3 fatty acids are just higher because one of the richest sources of omega-3 fatty acids happens to be fish. So if you're a person who's like has to avoid entire categories of food because of intolerances, then uh, supplementing may be very, very valuable um, to you. Um, another category, autoimmune, people with autoimmune issues. People with certain autoimmune issues, in particular the digestive ones like Crohn's disease, they just don't absorb as much uh, nutrients from their food as they do from uh, in comparison to other people. Now, is it is it more common that they have an autoimmune like that, and then that's caused, or that they had they were lacking the nutrients, therefore it caused these uh, autoimmune issues? What's more, chicken or egg, right? So, like, right, right. like your like your example, for example, you have um, psoriasis you've had for a while. Right. We know that vitamin D, low vitamin D, is is connected to psoriasis, and you've said this yourself. When you supplement with vitamin D, you get lots of sunlight. Yeah. Psoriasis goes down. Now, was your vitamin D? Are your vitamin D levels hard to keep up because you have malabsorption? Um, and then, of course, is psoriasis worse because you have low vitamin D? It's hard to say. Sometimes it's one versus it's it's one or the other. Sometimes it doesn't matter. For example, if you have Crohn's disease and you're having nutrient deficiencies and you're trying to eat good foods and it's not working, that person may benefit from supplementing with a high dose vitamin or mineral that they're lacking. My, mm. my theory for myself personally and after understanding uh, psoriasis as an autoimmune, understanding how much the vitamin D has helped me, it it makes a lot of sense to me. And this is a great example of what we were talking about, how it takes a long time to uh, reveal itself. Mm. Uh, psoriasis didn't pop up on me until I was about 25. I, I, it was somewhere between 24 and 26. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to guess 25 is when it, it first uh, revealed itself. And when I found out later on after we met Sal that uh, there's a good chance that I had a vitamin D deficiency, and when I started supplementing, I saw a drastic difference in how bad my psoriasis was. What makes the most sense for me, because vitamin sunlight is one of the great sources of vitamin D for us, is I was a kid who grew up in the sun, like I literally seven days a week, hours on every single day all of my life until I hit 19. At 19 years old, I moved to San Jose, got a job inside of a gym, and then and fell in love with it and began, began working underneath fluorescent lights from literally 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. at mm-hmm. night, mm-hmm. religiously, and very rarely got sun. Now, I didn't see anything. No psoriasis came up, no problems, but it, years of consistently not getting the sunlight like i like i i believe my body had adapted to intaking that much over my childhood then all of a sudden i go cold turkey almost and cut it off and then find my body's resilient didn't show anything didn't show anything yeah cuz you store vitamin d in your system so yeah. i'm sure you had a nice store of right. vitamin d and you still get it from some foods right like mushrooms and things like yeah. that so i'm sure that i was still getting some but what i was used to getting it took a while for it to reveal itself all of a sudden at 25 it pops up at what i feel like is out of nowhere mm-hmm. and years i go on to battling that and then years later it wasn't until i connected that until we met 
uh, with vitamin D. So I think what happens a lot of times, and that's why this is diff difficult, this is also why I love companies like Everly Well that help us kind of test and peer into this a little bit. Yeah, because you were able to test your vitamin D and yes. you were supplementing and it yes. bumped it a little bit, but not much. No, I was still- So you know I need to take way more. Right. I was, I was taking 5,000 IUs and I was still testing low. It wasn't, I have to be about 10,000 IUs a day for me to hit that range. Mm -hmm. And again, I just think that my body adapted to getting so much vitamin D for the first half of my life. Now the back half, when- you know, of course, uh, just like we say, go whole foods, even before I want to try and supplement with vitamin D, my goal is always to get in front of my juve light or get outside and get the real sunlight. Like that number one, real sunlight, second option, red light, third option, take my vitamin D right. or I'm, I'm using both. Yeah, and uh, here's this is another part to consider is as your circumstances change, so do potentially your nutrient demands. Mm -hmm. So here's a circumstance right away. Now we talked about diets. So we said, oh, if you're vegan or if you're keto or whatever and you're cutting out a whole segment of food, what about if you just cut your calories? Here's something to consider. The vast majority of the nutrients that you get uh, come from your food. What if you cut your calories? You're eating 1,200 calories a day. You didn't just lower your calories. You also lowered your nutrient intake. Mm -hmm. So it's pro it may be more important for people who are dieting to supplement than people who are eating tons and tons of food because that 1200 calories it consists of nutrients micronutrients as well and now that you and here's the thing people have a tough enough time looking at macronutrients proteins fats carbohydrates and tracking cal calories right nobody's talking about micronutrients nobody is so so when you look at your food and you enter it into your 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 my fitness pal or fat secret or your your macro tracker and you're like cool i'm eating enough calories to get my body to burn body fat, you don't know if you're hitting the right amount of nutrients that your body in your specific body needs. And in different circumstances also change the demands. Uh, exercise changes the demands of certain nutrients. How much you sweat changes the demands. If you're a female and you're menstruating, that can also change your nutrient demands. And there are certain nutrients that are more important for women to take when they're menstruating than when they're not. You know, Dr. Jolene Brighton talked quite a bit about the value of supplementing with like like B vitamins for women who are menstruating. So those are that's something else you want to you want to uh, you know look at and uh, consider. Also, you know, talked about sunlight. If you're not in the sun yeah. very very Environmentally. often, yes, you know, look at that. Look at okay, I'm never out in the sun. Uh, you you might need to supplement with something like uh, vitamin D or vitamin you know. Yeah, I was D3. immediately thinking of uh, I don't know that that Viking documentary where they're talking about having to get cod liver oil because they just didn't see enough of the sun and it started to generations would go and you'd see that in in you know the next generation like all these deficiencies mm -hmm. like what they would lead to in terms of like their height or like their bone structure and all these things. Oh yeah, it was one of the uh, some historians think that's one of the 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 advantages they have why they were so strong and able to defeat so many people as they were, you know, cruising around and people were deficient and weak and they were eating cod liver oil, which is very high indeed. There was no sunlight because it was winter in, in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, they were doing, you know, quite well. Yeah. So now, now why is food best? Because I, th I know, I, I think some people are like, okay, I've had people ask me this, like, what's the difference? Whether I get my vitamin B6 from food or I get it from uh, a vitamin, what's the difference chemically? You look at them under a microscope, they're the exact same thing. In fact, oftentimes, vitamins and nutrients and whatever are taken from food. So what's the difference? Why is food best? There's a couple reasons. One, it's much harder to overdose on nutrients and vitamins and minerals from food than it is from supplements. It's very easy, for example, to, sup to overdose on vitamin A mm -hmm. with a vitamin A supplements, and that can be very, very toxic. Very difficult to do through food. You'd have to eat a ton and ton of organ meats. Like, I mean, way more than anybody would ever eat in order to have uh, problems like that happen. Also, whole foods tend to come with cofactors that improve absorption. Uh, things like vitamin K2 for vitamin D3 or bioflavonoids with vitamin C or other nutrients that help with the absorption of the main nutrients that the food provides. Food is the ideal right. source 
And these uh, are the things that the perfect shuttle. Like nature's already figured it out. Like you know, it's funny to see all these like slow absorption rate. Like it's like in the marketing of like certain pills and things where you know you could get that from real food and just like the fiber and everything else like involved with the food. It it helps with the whole digestive and, process. And and this is what we know. The thing that it, it, it annoys me about these types of conversations, especially with like scientists, friends of ours, that, that like to your point, Sal, like you're, you could look under a microscope and this has this much B12, right. so does this food, therefore they're equivalent. Well, that's what we know so far. You've thrown out some other cofactors, but there's still things that we're learning about the gut and, what, and the digestive system that is still we're unsure about. So you can't tell me that we know everything mm -hmm. about the difference of getting it the way. And it's really crazy how, when it's found in nature, I mean, uh, I love to give the example with sugar, like, you know, it, you talk about overdosing on supplements. Well, you know, it's cause it's a concentrated form of whatever is from a food. Mm -hmm. Well, same thing goes for something like sugar. Like we, if we took sugar in it's, it's raw form, you would never overeat it. Mm. It would be impossible. You would to get like what a, a, what's in a soda can. You'd have to eat eight feet of sugar cane, which <laughs> yeah. it, it just unless unless you've got you know jaws like a freaking gorilla or like a panda bear, you're not going to be able to get through that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the same thing goes for uh, and sugar is obviously demonized, but it's the same concept. It's the way it's found in nature and raw. It was intended to be consumed that way. Uh, the same thing goes for when we talk about vitamins and supplements. Always ideally you know, targeting through whole foods. Yep. And so when I coach and teach clients, when they find out, oh, I have this de deficiency, instead of us just automatically going, oh, okay, let's just start supplementing for vitamin D or A or K or whatever it is. Let's educate them on what foods that that's rich in that. And then let's try and target that. And this is even how, so vitamin D is, is a common one in, in mine. Uh, Omega threes are common uh, in my cupboard. And though I try and pay attention, like if I had a week where, which is, uh, rare now, but it still happens occasionally where I go up to like the lake and I'm spending a week on the lake and in the sun. Like I'm not also stressing about supplementing with my vitamin D that week. If there's a week I'm going to not supplement it, that's the week. If I had a great week of eating fish, maybe we just went fishing and we caught tons of fish. So the whole week we're in Mecca, we do this when we go down to Cabo, we fish at the beginning of the week. We live off of the fish for an entire week. I probably don't need to be supplementing with my omega-3 during that week. So learning to try and target the whole foods first, supplement it when you need it. Well, I'll give you a great example, okay? Um, you guys have all heard of the of mercury content in fish, mm -hmm. right? Mercury um, builds up in the system. If you have too much of it, it can totally become toxic, okay? Fish contains mercury. Does that mean I got to be careful if I eat too much fish? And For the most part, no, and here's why. Because fish, most fish, also contains a high amount of selenium, and selenium binds to mercury. So eating most fish, even though they may have mercury, the natural selenium that's found in the fish offsets it and makes it okay. Now, there are a few fish that this, where the mercury outweighs the selenium. A good example would be like swordfish, way more mercury than selenium. But most fish that you would eat, that you that's it's not like the, the, the few that are where the mercury is so high. Selenium is high enough to where you can eat it and you're okay. And you, you see this. You see this in cultures around the world that have a high consumption of fish Yet mercury poisoning is very, very low, even though paradoxically they have a high intake of mercury. It's the natural selenium. And, and this is important to consider too, like I said earlier with, the, with supplements. Taking too much is just as bad as not having enough. So having a deficiency is bad. Having too much mm -hmm. of certain nutrients can cause problems as well. So food naturally makes this it much it makes it much harder to overdose and it tends to improve the absorption of certain things food is always best but that being said uh if you have a deficiency supplements can can have a, a huge impact well we we took the time to list what the the top 10 uh most common deficiencies like nutrient deficiencies found and i'm, I'm this is why we're starting here in this supplement conversation uh, because the most uh, common thing that I see as far as misusing supplements is I get clients and they, you know, somebody sold them on some muscle building stack or some fat burning stack. You know, they've got all these bottles and jugs and shakes that they're taking. Meanwhile, they've got all these deficiencies because their diet is all whack. Yeah, you could mm -hmm. break the supplement category into there's really two ways that I would recommend supplements to someone. And it's either to fill a deficiency, which trumps anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So that's number one. If you have an actual, actual micronutrient deficiency, 
filling that deficiency will have a, a, a massive prof- impact. Yeah, a, a massive, profound, uh, beneficial impact. Um, the set the, and not having not filling that deficiency can cause you uh, lots of problems. The other half is improving performance, building you know muscle and burning body fat, which is far less important than than making sure you don't have a deficiency. I'm glad you said that though, because this is what I see is. You're deficient in all these areas, yet you're taking the the performance supplements to get to build muscle. It's like having a, a a little sports car, drag racing car, and you're throwing a spoiler on it. Meanwhile, you have two front flat tires. Mm-hmm. It's you're 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 getting a little bit of edge by throwing the spoiler on there to help with wind resistance. But you ain't moving. <laughs> but you're you're moving really slow because you've got two flat tires. Like fix the flat tires, the obvious thing that's going to make your the machine operate and run faster before throwing a fucking spoiler or an exhaust system on it. And to- that's the same concept totally. when you when you, we look at supplementation is you know the the stuff that's over glamorized with the. The, all the the sexy bodies and the burning the fat and all every everybody gravitates to that. Meanwhile, their diet's all fucking whack and they're spending two three hundred dollars in supplements. That was really what uh, when we first started the podcast. It was a lot of our messaging was around that was yeah. trying to help people save, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month. You know, falling into these gimmicks that they need to buy these supplements to get to their results. When if they actually just started to hone in on their programming and their diet, they would see more results than they've ever seen in their lives. Totally. Now, um, you you can test, you can get yourself tested to identify uh, deficiencies. Um, if you ask your doctor, they could probably run a test for you. There are at-home tests. I know Everlywell does uh, does one as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through the, the we'll, I think we should go through the more common, right? Like you said, Adam, the more common <laughs> deficiencies that we find in modern Western societies. Uh, these are ones that are just more often than not, uh, or or just more common than others in terms of when we test people. Here's where we start to see the deficiencies. Well, then after you do that, also give what foods that you would find. Totally, yeah. totally, hundred percent. So foods. the first one's vitamin B6. Uh, B6 is a of the of the nutrient deficiencies. It's it's kind of up there, and you start to see this. And this one's an important one for women. I know Dr. Jolene Brighton says that. A lot of women uh, are more more women are deficient in B six than men. It may have to do with uh, with the, their changing hormones and, and menstruation. Um, places you could get vitamin B six: poultry, meat, and if you want a non animal source, uh, chickpeas. Chickpeas are actually high in B six. Here's something you're going to notice as a theme as we go through these. Okay, um, it, the the nutrients typically are more readily absorbed through animal sources than they are through uh, uh, vegan sources. Not always, but generally speaking. Again, this is not an anti-vegan thing that we're trying to do here. This is just the fact that when they do tests on people, they find that, oh, you're low in, in B6. It tends to get raised up higher when they consume more you know, poultry, for example, than eating more. more well, and, and this is and this is to the point that you've made multiple times about talking about the vegan diet is that it's not that it's not possible. It just takes a lot more planning. Right. So if you're automatically going to cut meat, which and what uh, infuriates me, this trend that we see because of the Netflix documentaries is, you know, I've got my my teenage nieces that see it and they go like, oh, they just stop eating meat now. They're just eating fucking salads all day long. Yeah. It's like okay, if you're going to cut poultry out of your diet. You, are you eating chickpeas? Mm-hmm. You know, how often are you doing that? Like, you need to do your homework if you're going to do a diet like that. Because as soon as you cut meat out, you cut out one of the most nutrient dense food groups that, you, like you said, there's going to be a theme. Oh, you'll see. Yeah, you'll see as we go through. All right. So the next one, um, iron, um, iron deficiencies. Uh, these, this one again, more common in women. Um, and uh, you know, symptoms of this are just feeling weak, malaise, uh, low energy. Of course, meat, very high in iron. That's the best source of iron. It's extremely absorbable. will raise your iron levels faster than anything else. Um, eggs are another source. Spinach, you can get iron from spinach, but you have to eat a lot of it to raise your iron levels. If you have an iron deficiency, as identified by a doctor, you can try raising it but with your vegan sources, but they may recommend you have to take supplements or eat meat. I've had a few clients that this happened to where their iron levels were low, they were vegan, and at some point the doctor's like, you need to eat, either eat meat yeah. or you need to take this pill of iron. Iron supplements can cause constipation in some people, but iron-containing foods do not. Again, another example of why uh, foods are the best sources of, uh, of nutrients. Uh, vitamin D. 
This one's becoming more common nowadays just because nobody's outside anymore. We're all inside. Some people, uh, I've, I've actually read articles where they've said that vitamin D is, we're like at an epidemic of low D levels. Vitamin D is extremely important for the immune system. It's a, uh, some, some scientists would consider vitamin D a hormone just by the way it acts in the body. Low D levels can affect your hormones for sure. And men, it can lower testosterone. That's a big one. Um, I talked about the immune system. One, it's, it is believed that one of the reasons why there's a flu season is because of low vitamin D levels. If you, in fact, look at the peak levels of infection, of flu and the rhinovirus, which is the cold, you'll notice it happens in February, which is a good three months after we're starting to get less sunlight. So it's like D levels decline, decline, decline. Boom, we get this explosion of infections. And they think this may be one of the main reasons why we get these, uh, you know, we get uh, more ill in the winter. So D, a very common one. Of course, the best way to ri- raise vitamin D, sunlight. There's mm-hmm. there's nothing that'll raise vitamin D more effectively than sunlight. But there are foods that are high in vitamin D. We talked about cod liver oil. That's more of a supplement, although it is one of the supplements I think is more like a food because it literally is an oil from- yeah, you could eat cod livers. Exactly. And, and that's going to be just you know the same. Exactly. And it contains a decent amount of vitamin A too, which is complementary. But egg yolks- and then for vegans, or if you're looking for a non-animal source, mushrooms. But mushrooms contain a form of vitamin D called D2. Hmm. D2 does not raise vitamin D levels in the blood nearly as effectively as D3. So if you're a vegan and your D levels are low, get lots of sunlight. If that's not working, I suggest supplementing with a D3 uh, supplement that you can find uh, at your health food store or whatever. Um, iodine. You guys know iodine was... Uh, uh, such a problem for a long time that it became mandatory to infuse salt with iodine. You guys ever use Morton oh, salt? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. ever notice that? This is I noticed why? They, they, yeah, they put that on there. Yes. It also they 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 it became like uh, I believe it was government enforced at one point to add iodine to salt because we were noticing all these effects of iodine deficiencies, uh, especially in children. Um, and it worked. It worked for a while. Now, is, is kale a, a main source of that too? Because I saw like from people eating too much of say kale or was seaweed. Seaweed. It yeah. might have been seaweed. Yeah, seaweed's very high in iodine. Fish. Fish is also um, high in iodine. And of course, table salt. <laughs> it's infused with iodine, but um, believe it or not, that's where most people will get their, their iodine. Uh, vitamin C is another one. Now, vitamin C tends to be infused in everything. I, I don't know about you guys, but anytime you buy a food that's oh, in, a, yeah. in a wrapper or a box, it always like, you know, added vitamin C or whatever, um, which is kind of funny. But if you if you need more vitamin C, citrus fruits are a very, very good source. Uh, B12 is another good. Now, B12 is one that vegans uh, pretty much can't get from uh, vegetable sources unless they're fortified. So, if you're a vegan and you eat like fortified cereals, for example, oh, great source. Yeah, then you'll get you'll get your B12. But the best it's natural some source, Cheerios. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The the best source of B12 naturally is meat. Uh, there is no natural, really natural, you know, vegan source of B12 uh, that you can find. So you'll have to supplement that. Calcium uh, it tends to be low. Uh, also, dairy, leafy greens, and tofu will have that. Uh, magnesium is another one. You can find that in beef. Uh, and then avocados and nuts are pretty high. Here's a big one. Omega-3 fatty acids. This one's really important. Low omega-3 fatty acids uh, intake has been uh, connected to heart issues, heart disease, uh, you know, uh, certain cancers, inflammatory uh, issues, low cognitive function, and uh, uh, brain impaired brain development among children. The best form, hands down, of omega-3 fatty acids are fish. You cannot get uh, omega-3 fatty acids from vegan sources. You can get a a, ver- a type of uh, fatty acid from flax seeds that your body has to convert to omega-3. So you could you could take flaxseed oil or eat flax seeds, and you could raise your omega-3 fa- uh, blood levels. But you'd ha- it's it's a lot harder. It's it's not nearly as effective. So if you're really deficient, 
um, and you're vegan, you may have to supplement with and, an animal source. And these aren't in order because I I, I believe that omega threes is like one of the top. Omega threes and in, in, in vitamin D are probably the biggest. Yeah, are probably top ones. two, one and two right there. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a time where like doctors just automatically just prescribed that to everybody. Yeah. Like if you yeah. came in the doctor, oh, get on omega threes, omega threes. Almost all my clients in the last decade. Oh yeah, of training. There I was remember. a big boom for oh, that for a while. I remember they would. I'd sit down with them. They're like, "Oh, I take my omega 3 So that was a big message for uh, for a few decades there because of how deficient everybody right, right. was. Uh, folate is another big one. Folate is found in egg yolks, and a vegan source would be asparagus. Although again, um, it's far. It doesn't raise blood levels as well. Um, as egg yolks do, that's one of the best sources of folate. If you're trying to conceive or you're pregnant, this is a very uh, important nutrient, but you're probably supplementing with it at that point, um, like we talked about earlier. Potassium, um, sometimes we see deficiencies there. Beef, salmon, and then, of course, bananas. We know about bananas. Everybody, that's like all the credit bananas get is that they're high in potassium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah loaded with 40 grams Lots of sugar. Though. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Glucose. Vitamin A, organ meats are some of the highest sources of vitamin Glucose. A. Um, uh, fish, um, and then the vegan sources, sweet potato, carrots, or orange foods that are orange, vegan foods that are orange, it typically means it's got, you know, vitamin A or beta carotene, uh, which, you know, raises vitamin A levels. So those are the more common ones, but here's the thing. You know, we just went through this list. That doesn't mean you go to the store, buy all these and take them just because you heard <laughs> on mind pump that they're common because some of these are not water soluble. Many of them are right. Uh, water soluble vitamins. You can, I can take. 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C and I might get some indigestion, but I'll excrete what I don't use. If I overdid it on a fat soluble vitamin like vitamin A, vitamin D, or on a mineral uh, like calcium, I can cause myself a lot of problems. In fact, uh, with calcium, they were finding uh, artery dep deposits uh, in people because they thought, oh, calcium strengthens bones. I'm just going to take a ton of calcium. Yeah, and it was causing. It can cause some serious problems. Go, so. go get tested. I mm -hmm. mean, go to go get go to your doctor. Get blood work done. Uh, you know, you're what you're going to find is that your most people have are pretty con. Or that you have their their basic diet or basic foods they eat, and when you go get it, it'll tell you a lot. It'll tell you a lot of probably what you lack in. And when you get when you find out, it'll probably be kind of obvious to you too. Like, oh wow, I I need omega three, so I never eat fish. Like, okay, or oh, vitamin D. I work inside all the fucking time, and mm -hmm. I don't ever have mushrooms, or I don't ever have egg yolks. Okay, that makes sense. Like, you know, do the do the 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 test, do the work um, at least one time. I think it's it's that. I mean, I would tell all my clients before. Uh, things like Everlywell and at-home test came around because even with Everlywell, you have to do a lot of these individually. Um, that could get really expensive too, going through each one individually. I like what I prefer and what I recommend is get the blood work, find out all the places you may be deficient, and then I follow up with Everlywell. So for example, if I go do my blood work, find out that I am, uh, I'm deficient in vitamin D, now I don't need to go in and spend the 200 something dollars every single time I want to get my blood work done with my doctor. I just do my 50 or $100 at-home test just to kind of check up on it to make sure that when I make the adjustments in my diet that I'm, I'm keeping it up where it needs to be. But to me, before you go invest in spending hundreds of dollars on performance supplements, this is the place that you start. You start here and figure out if you have a flat tire or not, or your timing belt is off. Fix and address that before you even think about investing in totally. any other supplements we're going to go Totally, and then, and then you keep track. Here's the other thing you want to consider. There are levels uh, of nutrients that it, it, when they do your testing, that they have a threshold, and you don't want to go below the threshold because you run the risk of having you know, nutrient deficient, uh, related disorders and diseases. But that doesn't mean that just because you're above the threshold, you're in the optimal range. There are optimal ranges and then there's minimums. Okay. So do your research. So if you do get a vitamin D test and you find like, Oh, I'm within range, look up optimal vitamin D levels, optimal vitamin A levels, uh, look up these things, functional medicine doctors. And it, there are some sites that will talk about these because optimal is typically higher, a little bit higher than the minimum amount that will prevent, you know, nutrient deficient related diseases. So that's it. Those are the those are all the ones that that are, are common. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a potential deficiency to other nutrients. Also, doesn't mean that you you have one uh, a deficiency related to the ones I just talked about. Uh, the key here is to get to get tested, and if you find a deficiency, supplement for it. That is a hundred percent most important way uh, to supplement. For and yourself. they're a lot cheaper. 
Yes. It's, a, it's a lot cheaper to put some air in your tires than it is to buy a brand new spoiler. Brand new <laughs> yeah. spoiler, way more expensive, brakes all the time. Not fu- you pump up your tires, you're good to go. Like literally just invest in that and then taking a vitamin D, vitamin K, C, all the ones that we went through, those aren't that expensive. No. You get them for relatively cheap. You can. Yeah, and it's not it's not that big of a deal. And then again, it should last you a long time if you try and use it the way I was explaining where – you're targeting Whole Foods. You know you're deficient there, so you know it's an area that you you want to have it at your disposal inside your cupboard. But then my goal always is to try and you know up my fish intake. But mm-hmm. hey, there's weeks where a lot of beef and chicken was ate, but very little uh, fish was eaten. Oh, okay, so this is a day that I'm going to make sure that I get yeah. my omega threes. Yeah, I don't want one of those pill cases where you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you have all these huge horse pills you got to like ingest all day long. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to end up like I'm always looking for whole food sources and incorporating that more, whatever I am deficient in. Yeah, and it's you know it's funny. Uh, Jessica's really good at this, right? Like, so we're, we're in the process of we, you know we just got married we're in the process of trying to to get pregnant and so she's looking at all the important nutrients so i see her now i see her eating three to four egg yolks every morning to make sure she gets the full i also saw her before when she would you know get on when she would have her period she would we would be eating way more red meat and i'd ask her well how come and she's like well i need more of these b vitamins and it works phenomenally so the whole food sources are the best but again if you find a deficiency you don't want to change your diet Uh, Go with the supplement. Okay, so now we're out of the supplements to fill deficiencies category. Now we can head into the one that everybody loves and gets excited about, which are supplements to improve performance, help you build muscle, and burn body fat. The fun stuff. Number one has to be, of that category, has to be protein. Hmm. It has to be the the, probably the most beneficial performance-enhancing, muscle-building supplement that there is uh, just just based off of the clients that we've worked with. Well, and the irony of this is that it's because of what we just talked about is because it's one of the most common deficiencies. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get enough protein through diet and whole foods, you know, it's not necessary anymore. But because this is an area that most people, unless we're talking to the bodybuilding community, because we know they eat six chicken breasts a day, Besides that community, the average American really struggles to get enough protein for optimal performance. You go back yes. to your optimal thing, right? Yep. Most they're people, not they're not deficient in it, protein. Yes, you know, but yep. they don't, but they're not eating enough to maximize the muscle building effects that protein could provide, or to maximize the satiety effects of protein, or the thermogenic fat burning potential of protein. They're just not eating enough. I, I you know, you talk about this all the time, Adam. I almost, unless I had a client who, like you said, was in that bodybuilding space, I almost never had a client give me their their food tracking when they first start. I almost never saw it and said, "Oh wow, you're you're in the optimal range right. of protein intake." Yeah, it was always like, you know, I'd say for women, I would see protein intakes of 30, 50 grams a day, seventy maybe. You know, when, when most of them would have benefited from 100 grams or 120 grams of protein. Protein intake uh, has been shown in studies quite conclusively at high levels. And high is about 0.6 to 1 gram per pound of body weight in relatively lean individuals. If you're obese, you want to use your lean body mass. But protein in that range has been shown to build more muscle, add more strength, um, and to regulate appetite and also hold on to muscle when people are dieting. When people are, are reducing their food intake to lose weight, when their protein intake is higher, they lose less muscle, which is a great thing because one of the problems of dieting is a slower metabolism mm-hmm. from muscle loss. So protein becomes extremely important. Now, here's the problem with protein. When I had a 130-pound a, a cli- female client and I'm telling her to eat 110 grams of protein a day, how many... You know, how many six ounce chicken breasts is that? Right. You know, they're eating a lot of meat throughout the day and it's just hard. It's inconvenient. And so protein powders became extremely valuable. Uh, to that population. And again, you're, we're using this the same way that we're, we were using the last supplements we just talked about. I, I see tremendous value. I've always got a vegan protein and a whey protein in my house. They're all, I've always got them in my coverage, but they last me quite a, quite a while because again, I'm not trying to take the protein powder. I'm trying to get all of my protein intake through whole foods. But the reality is that a lot of times that doesn't happen. 
that's where I utilize that supplement. It does, it's not a supplement like it's not used the way I think the bodybuilding community tries like to use. Take it. it every day, right? Every day at post workout, it's like this ritual to do that. Like, no, you don't need to do that. In fact, you don't want to do that if you can get it through Whole Foods. Again, you want to try and get it through Whole Foods, but the reality is, a majority of the population, including ourselves, miss those targets. That's why you use a supplement like this for sure, hands down, of all the ones that are going to benefit you for overall fat loss or building muscle i would definitely rate this is the is the number yeah. one after you've handled it yeah deficiency. and it's just you know you know protein powders are convenient i can take them with me anywhere typically protein powders uh don't contain lots of carbs or fats so i'm minimizing the calorie intake you know 40 gram uh, shake of protein you know might have 180 calories uh, but getting 40 grams from a meat source might be twice as many calories because there's added fat and whatnot. So if you're dieting and you're noticing, you know, if you're trying to cut your cut down and you're noticing that, oh, I need more protein, but I only have so many calories to work with, protein shakes can can help uh, quite a bit. And there's a lot of good quality ones out there. But this one, I definitely think I see the most benefit. Well, I feel sure. like we have to address that a little bit though too because uh, don't get caught up in the – Looking for the cheapest source, I get uh, I get DMs uh, quite often about you know oh I you know I looked at Organifi and Legion and they tend to be more expensive protein powders now because this is probably the number one uh, supplement that you should take for building muscle or burning body fat as far as you know getting what your body needs to and perform optimally because of that it's also marketed to and there's a slew of people making all kinds of money in this space and because the supplement industry is not regulated through like the FDA there's a lot of leeway in what people are utilizing to make these supplements so you know you pay for what you get oh totally Prote a protein is not cheap yeah. real real protein is not cheap it's uh, relatively expensive um, so don't skimp out um, uh, on when you're taking a protein powder supplement, but of course, food um, again is is totally ideal. Uh, it's funny. I, I, I was I was reading other studies on protein intake. As people get older, they're showing studies now that they need to, need to increase their protein intake as they get older to help prevent the muscle wasting that comes from uh, getting older. They seems to, they seem to benefit even more from a higher protein intake than. Uh, than younger people do. Now you don't need to eat like the bodybuilder amounts of protein, but most people listening uh, don't get that one gram of protein per pound of body weight or the 0.7 grams, uh, you know, protein per pound of body weight. The next supplement, um, uh, creatine. Creatine is it, it? It's not protein. It's not a essential nutrient. If you're getting adequate amounts of protein in your diet, your body will synthesize creatine from three amino acids. However, supplementing with creatine has been shown across the board in thousands of studies. It's actually one of the most supp the studied supplements uh, known to man. Um, has been shown in many, many, many studies to have tremendous muscle building benefits uh, uh, the side effect of which also is fat loss and lots of studies now showing health benefits from supplementing with creatine. The population that could benefit the most from supplementing with creatine, vegans, mm -hmm. mainly because creatine can only be found in animal sources, red meat being one of the highest uh, concentrations. Studies actually show that vegans who supplement with creatine get a tremendous health benefit, um, one of which being Cognitive boost they actually show IQ, uh, IQ boosting from supplementing. Which I wonder about that, especially with true vegans who don't like ingest anything animal related. If that's a problem, you know, just supplementing. You with can creatine. get vegan. You can get uh, creatine that's Is there like made in a lab, like correct. a version. Okay. Correct, and it's it's a vegan uh, form of creatine. Highly recommend it. Here's a supplement that I recommend. To most people, after of course diet is good and all that stuff, uh, but I, I don't. If your goal is fat loss, if your goal is muscle building, if you just want to be healthier, if you just want to feel less stiff, uh, if you just want cognitive boosting, I'm typically going to say, hey, you know, diet looks good, workout looks good. Let's try supplementing with some high quality creatine uh, and see what happens. 
the amount that people supplement with, anywhere between two to five grams, five grams being high, two grams probably being more appropriate. Right. I, t- I say people. five grams for somebody who doesn't eat a lot of meat and somebody who does eat uh, adequate meat, I'm saying two to three grams yeah. is, is plenty. They're showing brain health benefits, heart health benefits, uh, anti-aging benefits. They're, they're, they're showing now with creatine supplementation. It could increase the amount of mitochondria mm. um, in the body, which are the energy uh, powerhouses. Um, it's got antioxidant properties for uh, for the heart even. Creatine's a phenomenal supplement, and it's funny because it started in the muscle building space. Yeah. In fact, at one point, uh, it was like people were freaked out about it because it was like in the 90s in particular when it first came out. Oh, it's like steroids. No, no, none of that. It's a, it's a natural uh, compound. Uh, does not have uh, hormonal effects, although in men with low testosterone, it may actually boost testosterone through uh uh, fueling the testosterone process in the testes, but creatine uh, a great. Well, great it just it, 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 it simple forms it, it, simple form. It just replenishes energy at a much faster rate. So mm-hmm. just think of all the people and situations that benefits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if you're a, a CrossFitter, a marathon runner, a power lifter, and an average gym goer. Uh, knowing that whatever, because you're taking creatine, your energy replenishes at a faster rate. That's it. That's it. It's that. I mean, and that the carryover to that is in in all pursuits of fitness is at the highest, and it's the only one. Like there's supplements out there, like in pre workouts that make you feel like you get more energy because it stimulates mm-hmm. your central nervous system, and so then you feel like you're wired, and so oh, you're getting no. That's like artificial energy. Like creatine actually replenishes energy at a faster rate, and it's been proven to be that that great of a performance supplement for years now. Now the effects of taking creatine, if you start supplementing it, here's what you may notice. And by the way, uh, I, I want to say this too: some people don't do well supplementing with creatine. Okay, so I, I know we're selling it real hard, and what I don't want is somebody to take it have gastro distress or diarrhea and be like, well, I'm going to keep taking it because they said, you know, it's such a great supplement. It ain't that good. Some people, <laughs> some people get uh, uh, stomach upset and uh, gastro distress from creatine. If you take it and that's you, not for you. But the vast majority of you should not um, have a problem. Here's what you'll notice when you supplement with creatine. After about five to seven days of supplementing it, you're stronger. It's, a, it's pronounced. You'll notice you're going to lift between five oh, to yeah. 10 pounds more on every lift. You'll notice that your muscles feel fuller and rounder, and you'll also notice maybe between one to five pounds extra on the scale, depending on how much muscle you have. The more muscle mass, the more weight you'll gain on the scale, the less muscle mass, the less weight you gain on the scale. Now, I know there's some people listening, probably in particular females who are thinking, I don't want to gain any weight, That's so I'm not going to take creatine. It's not making you gain body fat. It's literally uh, adding more hydration, intracellular hydration, so you're just... You're holding more water, but it's not bloat. Uh, it doesn't add water to the outside of your body like you're smooth. It's water inside the muscles. So if anything, it actually improves the appearance of m- more tone or more sculpt. Right. Gives you more, a little more definition. Right. Best source of creatine, creatine monohydrate. Uh, don't mess with the other types of creatine, the cray alkaline and the creatine citrate and all that other crap. Um, well, to the same point that I made with the protein butter, it's become so popular that everybody is in the space. And now to make it competitive, they're adding things to it or making cases why their absorption is faster, all that shit. Is- you know, it's so funny. Cray Alkaline came out and their big thing was absorbs better, absorbs faster, less bloat, which is so stupid because it doesn't cause bloat, but whatever. <laughs> Worst selling point ever. You want to know what's funny? They tested it head to head against monohydrate, and it actually your body absorbs less. Your your body absorbs creatine monohydrate superior across the board. So whatever supplement company you're looking at, if they're trying to sell you on why their type of creatine is better, there's no studies to support it. All the studies show that creatine monohydrate uh, is the best. The Legion makes a good uh, creatine monohydrate if you're looking for a brand. Um, all right, next supplement. I, this one is your guys' favorite. You guys fuck with this one. <laughs> All oh, especially Justin's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my that's I don't my think it's just, I don't think it's just us. I think it's probably 99% of yeah. the listeners. Yeah. It's <laughs> the most used drug in the world. Now, for that, overall production and for just like, you, you know, a, a, a nice, like clear state of mind. Like I can get things done. Like I just, it works, man. There's nothing else that even competes with it. Uh, or compares with it other than, uh, you know, that other one that they banned, right? So <laughs> Crystal meth? Yeah. yeah. Crystal yeah. Meth. Like Fedra. Yeah. Yeah. We're, Crack. Ta- we're talking yeah. about caffeine. Uh, caffeine is very, very widely studied. It's been used by, by humans for thousands of years. Um, it's a wakefulness agent. Uh, you do build up a very fast tolerance to it, so it's addictive. 
Um, so you could take caffeine. For anybody who's ever tried to go off coffee knows what I'm talking about. You feel like miserable for a week or two because your body has to reacclimate. Um, so best use of caffeine, in my opinion, is to take it uh, on an every other day basis or save it for the days you need that extra zip. The individual variance with tolerance in caffeine is wide, mm-hmm. super wide. Your liver uh, gets helps your body get rid of caffeine, and there is a genetic variant in some people where it doesn't work as fast. I think I have one of those. Like, If I do more than 300 gram, uh, milligrams of caffeine in a day, I don't feel good. You guys do more than 300 milligrams of caffeine yeah. in one sitting. Well, yeah. it goes, it, it comes in waves. And I think, too, I don't ever want to be dependent on anything either. And we, we try and stress that point a lot. If there's something that's reoccurring constantly and you haven't ever stepped away from it for a while, or it's like something like you're you're scared to, to stop doing, like that's something I'm going to want to address and make sure that like I'm cycling it in and out. So there's it's scheduled in there. So I am at least like lowering the amount of intake or completely off of it for a bit and then reintroducing well look caffeine has got antidepressive effects these are documented so it's a mild antidepressant obviously improves productivity it's a wakefulness agent it can help with fat mobilization that doesn't mean it's a very powerful fat burner well you move Um, a lot more but (laughs) there's that 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 being said to that point sal uh what won't make this list as we're going through are fat burners Mm. and any fat burners that carry any weight whatsoever the the piece of it that carries the most weight is the caffeine that totally they put true. in it. Yeah. So totally true. keep that in mind. And let me tell you, you can get a, a cup of coffee or caffeine pills for next to nothing. And fat burners are extremely expensive. The most valuable piece of a fat burner, 99.9% of the time will be the caffeine that's inside of it. Yep. And you can get caffeine in a pill form, super, super cheap for high doses of, of caffeine or s- just from black coffee. Yep. Yep. Yeah. From black coffee, black teas. Black coffee is the best. Yeah. Teas. Um, caffeine has got brain health benefits. It's got anti-cancer benefits, uh, uh, in particular for the liver. Um, It has a lot of benefits. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have potential negative side effects. If you consume too much caffeine, it will contribute to the physiological perceptions of stress. It can cause stress hormones to go up. And it is probably, hands down, the worst culprit for people's sleep issues. Insomnia. Yes. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Like, when I work with clients and they can't, ha- they don't have good sleep, uh, I would say seven or eight out of ten times when I reduced their caffeine intake, their sleep issues uh, became, went away. Not well, too, like uh, with the thyroid, I know it's not like advantageous to have like caffeine in the diet as well. Like that tends to like not pair well with any kind of thyroid issue. Yeah, you got to figure out your tolerance. So figure this out. Don't gauge it off other people. For I, I gave you mine, two to three hundred milligrams every other day is about as much as I can do, which is significantly lower than uh, Adam or Justin who to- have a wonderful tolerance for caffeine. I wish I had that tolerance. It is tolerance, wonderful. But I, <laughs> I, like I can't do it. Too. If I have too much, I feel I just feel Well, terrible. all that really means is that we can get away with more before we have to come back down the other direction. But yeah. it, it's inevitable we have to come the other way too. Because Everybody does. That's, yeah. You just don't feel the effects as much. Well, and that I always my selling point to people to get them to cycle down, because it's hard. You get, a, you get a client or you get somebody who loves their coffee. Oh my and, gosh, that's the hardest thing. And they drink you know three, four cups a day, or they have two cups of coffee plus an energy drink or two and, you tr- and a pre-workout or something. And you try and tell them you want to bring them all the way down, uh, they look at you like you're crazy. But what I always, you know, remind them and sell them on is that listen, you love caffeine, right? You'll love it even more when you've cycled off for a little bit and then you reintroduce it. You forget how amazing that feels when you've cycled off and then you've reintroduced. You know what's funny? That's true for all supplements. Not the cycling off, but more generally, uh, using them appropriately. Yeah. If you use supplements appropriately. Uh, especially the ones we're talking about, um, you can get great benefits. Use them inappropriately. Not only will you get not as great of benefits, you, you may actually get detrimental effects like caffeine. Like Use too much caffeine for your body. You're not going to get an athletic performance boost. For example, for me, if I have too much caffeine, I'm not lifting more weight. I'm not able to do more reps. I do less. I get out of breath. I feel terrible. I don't get mental sharpness. I get mental confusion if I have too much caffeine. It gives me anxiety. I don't feel good. I get worse sleep, right, if I have too much. So use the right amount for your body, and you get some amazing benefits. Now, one thing one, one thing I want to say about caffeine, caffeine pairs exceptionally well to one other supplement, which isn't on the list, but I'm going to say it because it's great with caffeine, theanine. 
the amin- the amino mm-hmm. acid theanine. Mm-hmm. If you take caffeine or you drink lots of coffee, try 200 milligrams of theanine for every 100 milligrams of caffeine. Doesn't Mike put that? Doesn't CBD. Mike put that in his? Yes, he so his pre workout contains. I was going to say, uh, yeah, he, contains stuff it has with theanine, the caffeine. Right? It does. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things I know that you fell in love with about his. Yes, theanine with caffeine smooths out the the energy and it keeps it there longer and it seems to uh, lower the tolerance building effect. So taking theanine may allow you to have caffeine a little bit more regularly than normal. I, I remember when you first started getting because we used to do this way before any of the supp- supplements. We would keep theanine on our uh, cold brew. Mm-hmm. And cold, anyone who's had, on the tap, yeah. And then anyone who's had cold nitro brew knows that like that's it's stronger, right? It hits you a lot. It's a lot higher in caffeine. Uh, and Sal started to get us to to take the theanine after I'd already been using uh, the cold brew for quite some time. W- the way I explain it, or what I notice is, you know, sometimes you could take enough coffee to where you feel a little antsy or anxious or jittery. Uh, it totally takes that edge off, and mm-hmm. it doesn't make you. And another thing, you another, don't lose the boost. And another side effect that you get from caffeine is a really hard spike, and then a crash a few hours later. It just it doesn't seem to spike as hard. No jitteriness, and then it's a it's a it's an even high that you kind of get from it. So that was what I noticed when you introduced theanine yeah, to every client caffeine. that ever that I ever worked with. Uh, I don't say ever, but uh, the back half of my career, I would say that that had coffee or would take caffeine. I would have them supplement with theanine, and they all became converts. After that, they always theanine with my coffee, and they got great results. So you don't have to, um, but uh, try it out and see for yourself. Theanine's super cheap. Especially if you're somebody who, that part of why you don't have coffee lost, because you get antsy or jittery. Try it with theanine and see if you notice a difference. Totally. Um, The last category, this one, uh, a more general category, um, uh, like we did with the first one, It's uh, these are adaptogens. These are a class of compounds that help the body deal with stress. So why is that important? Uh, A body that's more resilient to stress is going to be healthier, feel better. It's, you're going to get away with a lot more. Now, there's a lot. There's a, the adaptogen category is massive. So I'm going to list uh, some of my favorite ones. My absolute favorite adaptogenic supplement, which also has lots of Western scientific backing, is ashwagandha. Absolutely love ashwagandha uh, for its adaptogenic properties. Uh, it's also one of the most consistent testosterone-boosting uh, adaptogens in men with low testosterone. And when you take ashwagandha, um, if it's appropriate for you, you'll notice you just feel more energy and you just feel generally better. Adapt you, Your your muscles uh, adapt better to exercise. They show that people with high stress, when they take ashwagandha, they build more muscle, gain more strength, and have better fat loss. As well. how, how did you explain adaptogens when comparing it to like you know supplement like performance supplements or ergogenic or you know vitamin supplements? How would you explain adaptogens? Like it's a regulator. Like how would you? Yeah, literally, it literally strengthens your body's ability to handle um, stress. So if you have like a high stress life, you're not getting good sleep. Here's how I like to use adaptogens. I like to use adaptogens when I'm pushing the limit with my training. If I'm really pushing the limit. Then I'll start throwing adaptogens into my arsenal, and I'll start to feel like, okay, I feel good. I'm not, I, I'm not overtraining quite as easily. Or if I'm losing sleep, uh, or if I'm in a stressful situation, um, you know, I used a lot of ashwagandha when I was getting divorced, very stressful, uh, you know, situation. So I used it on a regular basis. It makes a, it makes a big difference. Now the adaptogens are not supplement, just like all the other performance supplements. You don't need to take these, by the way. But if you like to take supplements. Uh, this is a decent category. Now, are they are they all considered anti-inflammatory, or some of them anti-inflammatory? They are all. So they, here's how they're anti-inflammatory. They're not anti-inflammatory by just lowering inflammation in everybody. They're anti-inflammatory by regulating the inflammatory process to uh. keep it so that it's supposed it's in the it's where it's supposed to be. Uh. So it doesn't hammer inflammation like you know if I took ibuprofen, it's going to lower inflammation no matter what. Taking an adaptogen will get my body to use its inflammatory process in a more appropriate way. So if you if you have high inflammation, it will lower inflammation. If your inflammation is low, you're not going to go any lower by taking an adaptogen because your body doesn't need to. And what are some of the – like turmeric falls into that category? Turmeric is good. Uh, cordyceps, uh, one of my absolute favorites. Cordyceps is a great performance enhancer because of it. I also notice with cordyceps, my heat and cold – Tolerance go through the roof. So if I if I use the sauna, or I'm going to go outside in cold weather, 
Um, in fact, that's a supplement that I recommended a while ago to construction workers who work outside in, in harsh weather. Got tons of messages from people who were using cordyceps and noticed uh, a benefit from that. Rhodiola. Rhodiola is a stimulating adaptogen, meaning it does give you energy. I've uh, recommended it as a replacement for caffeine. So if you're trying to wean yourself off caffeine, you can take rhodiola. Not everybody does great with rhodiola, though. I'm one of those people. If I take rhodiola, I just don't feel... I don't feel good. I know, Adam, you too, right? I don't like it either. Yeah, it makes yeah. you feel kind of like... It ma- makes me feel uh, down. Yes, right? yeah, yes. It totally puts me in it. It does not give me energy. It, I don't feel fueled from it yeah. whatsoever. Now, most people will get energy from it. Most people take rhodiola and lots of Soviet studies on rhodiola from back in the day. That The Soviets were huge fans uh, of rhodiola. Um, so it's got lots of scientific backing. And, and again, here's the thing. It, it, we may be saying, oh, these are awesome. There's great studies. If you take it and you feel like shit, stop taking it. Right. Uh, because there's a, such a huge individual variance. Again, rhodiola, I tried rhodiola at least three times because all the studies show it works really well. Each time I took it after about the third day, didn't feel good. And I just, okay, rhodiola doesn't work for me. And, and we made this fifth and last because it probably will make the biggest difference. It's right? the least the, important. The least important of the all the other categories that we covered. Although there's lots of benefit, lots of value. I know Sal probably uses uh, adaptogens probably more. Although you had me using some of them uh, when I was trying to raise my testosterone levels. I was using ashwagandha. So there are there are benefits that I have utilized it. But of, of all the things that we talked about today, uh, the the reason why it was last is because I think there's the least amount of benefits in comparison to the everything yeah, else. Yeah, I think about. we did them in the right order, right? The vitamins and minerals uh, that could, that can replace deficiencies. Most important protein, protein second, creatine third, caffeine fourth, and adaptogens uh, fifth. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't supplements out there that we're going to talk about that may benefit you, but we listed the top five. Uh, generally speaking, from all the people we've ever worked with, and the majority of you listening, if you had to take a supplement, this would be the category. And we you left want to pull from. we left off all the T two four fat burners, no BC, BCAAs. Yeah, so there's we intentionally left those out because when you start to get to all that other like glutamine, like you start uh, separating all these things and making these great claims. Uh, knock these out first uh, before you waste your money on spending uh, on all these other uh, supplements that are yeah. overhyped. Now, if you have a great diet, great training regime, you get good sleep, you're fine. You're totally fine. You may benefit from taking some little bit of extra creatine. You can throw in some caffeine every once in a while, maybe some adaptogens if you're pushing your body. But honestly, uh, nothing, nothing that we talked about here will replace what a diet training, uh, routine, good lifestyle can do. They don't even come, they're not even the same universe. Yeah. So it's not even a comparison. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. They're all free. They cost nothing. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.